Okay, so the passage we're looking at is Luke 3, verses 1 through 14. And here we have, I think, the fullest description of um, the preaching of uh, John the Baptist and um, uh, what it is he did to get, interestingly enough, God's people uh, ready to receive their Messiah. And he had some pretty uh, direct things to say to them uh, to um, convict them and to try to wake them up so that they would get out of their complacency, out of their self-satisfaction, the idea that we're fine, and to begin seeking after the Lord. And, and that's really our goal of this evening is uh, what can we do for people who are complacent? Yeah, whether they believe or don't believe, they're complacent. Okay, well, let's begin by reading the text. So Luke 3, beginning in verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch uh, of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. In the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. Let me just pause there for a minute. A lot of details. And this is how we know that this is, this is not some fictional account. Is all the references to the people who were in power at that time. And we see, you know, Luke's mind at work here, the, uh, the one who was a physician. He's taking note of uh, those in power, so marking the time frame and, and giving to us really evidence that this is a real event that took place in, in history. So now this is what we read, okay? The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness, and he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Well, may the Lord um, help us to use this material to, um, to know how we might better evangelize. Okay. Well, again, last week we considered the question, does belief in election undermine evangelism? Okay. If we know that those who are not elect will never be saved and that those who are elect definitely will, whether we evangelize them or not, does that undercut our motivation to share the gospel? Well, we saw that Jesus believed in election and it certainly didn't stop him. As a matter of fact, Jesus was aware of, of all the doctrines we're very much aware of, right? He was aware of the spiritual condition of, of those who would hear him. He knew that what, um, well, I forget now whether it was a commentary by John or whether it was Jesus himself, but he knew that those who were in the darkness hated the light, which was him, and would not come to the light lest their evil deeds would be exposed, that they would never come unless the Father changed their hearts. He knew that among the, the 5,000 that were present, and by the way, that was just the men, there were also women and children, that very few of them, if any, would actually receive him.
because he knew the gate to life was narrow and that there were few who enter in that way. And yet, Jesus did signs in front of all of them. Okay? He healed the sick. He fed that vast multitude with, with almost nothing, you know, just a few loaves and fish. He crossed the sea without a boat, and all of this that he might gain their attention. And then he preached the gospel to all of them, to the elect and non-elect alike, because he knew that his father would, you know, had those who were his and would draw them through that preaching. Jesus, you know, th knew that this is how the wheat would be separated from the chaff. It was through the preaching of the gospel. The chaff would blow away. The wheat would be gathered into the barn, gathered, as it were, to his, to his heavenly Father. So election did not undermine his evangelism. It actually empowered it because he knew the Father would draw those who were his. And we need to remember that it can and will empower our evangelism as well because the Lord sends us to the same kind of audience, to a people who are hostile to the truth. And we are armed with the same reality that those who respond favorably are going to be relatively few. But we are still to draw them in through apologetics, you know, with the evidence that he provides in general revelation. And we can still, you know, we can't do miracles, but as we saw last week, we can point to the miracles of Christ, which are recorded for us in Scripture, uh, which prove that he is a messenger from God. And he says, of course, he tells us who he is, the Son of God and the only way to God. Uh, we are still to present the gospel once they're drawn in. We are to tell them why they need salvation, how God has provided it only in Christ. That's one thing that makes Christianity rather odious to the world is the fact that it's exclusive. There is only one way to God. And, of course, the only way to receive Him, of course, we need to tell them as well, which is by faith in Him alone. And we do this because we know that this is how Jesus will continue to winnow the wheat from the chaff, okay? So we know not everybody's going to respond. We know that just a few people are going to respond, but we do know that there will be people who will respond, that the Lord will gather his own to himself. And by the way, that's an argument for sharing the gospel broadly uh, because of the fact that only a few will be saved. Now, last week, we also touched on the question of what we might do in the case of those who already believe the, the facts of the gospel, who have what we call an historic faith, right? They have the same faith of the devils, okay? The devils believe and they tremble. But perhaps these people believe and, and they don't tremble, okay? They know what the Bible says is true. They're convinced there's a God. They're convinced the Bible is His Word. They're convinced that Jesus is the only Savior. They're convinced that they're on their way to hell and they have no hope apart from him, but they still won't receive him because they don't want him. So the question is, you know, last week we said, well, you know, they, they do need to seek. You know, they need to seek the Lord. But the problem is, if they don't want to do that, if there's nothing to motivate them, okay, they won't even do that much. And so the question is, is there anything we can do to motivate them? to seek for God's mercy? Well, the answer really is yes, and it, it's kind of interesting when you think about it because we can do for other people, as we're going to see what John the Baptist did, but we can do for other people what we did for our children or maybe what we're doing for our children, you know, as, as they're very young, when they were too young to seek, you know, when they weren't motivated, when, when there was nothing they could do. What did we do for them then? Well, we sought the Lord for them, okay? We brought the means to them. We warned them, we taught them about the gospel, and we prayed for them. And so we can do the same thing here. We can pray that the Spirit of God will use the means which we bring to them to wake them up to their danger that they might seek His grace. And this evening, I, I think we, we get a good example of this in John's ministry. So in our passage, we see a number of things. I'm only going to select a few things from here, but mainly what it is he was saying, okay? But we see in our passage that roughly six months before Jesus begins his ministry, that's typically how it's seen. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. 
Um, it's believed that both John, we know Jesus, were, began their ministries at roughly 30 years of age when um, uh, priests would enter into the office and so forth, that they probably began around that same time. That the Lord spoke to John in the wilderness and sent him to, an, to the area surrounding the Jordan to preach a baptism of repentance. Now, it may seem strange that John was sent to baptize, because we usually think, when we think of the Jews, we think of circumcision. Okay, what is this baptism, and how would the Jews understand this baptism? Well, they were familiar with it already, because it was the rite that was ministered to Gentiles, a cleansing rite, when they wanted to join with God's people. Uh, it was an admission on their part um, that they needed cleansing, okay, that they needed to repent of their um, you know, uh, what they were involved in with uh, apart from God and, and their false gods and their wickedness and their, their evil deeds. They needed to repent of that and trust in Israel's God. So what John the Baptist was actually doing was telling the people he was preaching to that they needed to submit to it as well. So in submitting to it, they would admit also their need of God's cleansing, which was available only through the one who was coming. So this is how John was fulfilling what was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight by preaching repentance and their need to turn from their sins and to be ready for the one who is coming. And I think the idea of the ravine being filled and the mountains being brought low, the, the humble being lifted up and the, the haughty being brought down to prepare them for the Lord. Now, one thing that, that is interesting here is that God sent John to preach primarily to his own people, right? To not, not John's people, although they were his people, but to God's people, right? To the natural children of Abraham, to those who were largely unconverted, but who believed not only that God existed, but also accepted Scripture as his word. Okay, so in, in other words, they were very similar to the people we want to address, you know, people who believe the truth of the gospel, but who are unconverted, okay? But there is one twist here. These also thought they were already safe. Now, even though this last detail makes them a little bit different than the target audience that, you know, as far as the question I want to answer this evening, I think that... Um, they can be dealt with in pretty much the same way because when you think about it, how can a person believe the gospel and believe that what the Bible says is true and be comfortable with where they're at? How can they, how can they be that way? Um, they must be thinking that somehow they're going to come out all right in the end. You know, they may seem like they don't care, but I, I think that they perhaps really do, unless they have some secret thing they're trusting in. Maybe the Lord is going to be merciful or something like that. But our approach is going to be pretty much the same in both cases, okay? So what is it that John did to help these who are in this situation? Again, they knew God existed. They believed the Bible was the Word of God. They thought they were safe, and yet they weren't. And that addresses, again, another group of people. But what did John do to help them? Well, first of all, he pulled their false hope out from under them in, in the first way by reminding them of what they truly looked like in God's eyes, what they truly were. Notice in Luke 3, verse 7, he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, compare that with the way that evangelism is typically done today. You know, this isn't exactly the way to win friends and influence people, but we need to realize, John, two things. John was a prophet, okay, and his mission was to preach. And when you're preaching, you, you can do something a little bit differently than, you're, than when you're witnessing uh, or doing personal evangelism. But again, that, you know, that, that spirit and that power of Elijah was a very powerful, convicting kind of a sermon. Now, they thought that they were God's children because of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. But John is telling them that far from being God's children, 
they were the devil's offspring, which is what he means by a brood of vipers. He asked them who warned them to flee from the coming wrath. And of course, he was referring to either God's judgment on the last day or perhaps the wrath that was coming in 70 AD that Jesus would later warn them about. And he told them the only way they could escape it was to repent. And that that repentance needed to be more than just in word only. It had to be a change of life. He says in verse 8, therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Words are cheap. You know, you can say, I love the Lord, or I am going to repent, but actions speak louder than words. They needed a change of life. Now, again, their hope was based on their relationship to Abraham. That's why they thought they were safe, and that's why John then goes after this. He says in verse 8 also, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. So yes, it's a blessing to be Abraham's children. It's a blessing to be a part of that covenant and to have all those privileges, but that covenant, John is telling them, doesn't automatically save them. As a matter of fact, it is a two-edged sword. If they believe, like Abraham, they would be safe. But if they didn't repent and turn to Christ, all those privileges that they had in that covenant God made with Abraham in the end would actually speak against them. So he's pulling the rug out from underneath them, okay? Uh, you think you're God's children because you're related to Abraham, because, because you are his children. God could raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Uh, you are the children of the devil. Now, the next thing he does is he presses the nearness of God's judgment and their need to act now. Jonathan Edwards once said that, um, you know, uh, things that are far away as far as time-wise don't really affect us that strongly. He even used this. He said, you know, pleasure that is far off is, is not as convincing or as motivating as danger that is near. And that's why Jonathan Edwards did preaching like this to try to wake people up. And that's what John the Baptist is doing. Look at verse 9. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What he's saying is that the Lord is coming to look at his orchard. And he's looking at what the trees are bearing. Is it good fruit or bad fruit? Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit, every uh, Jew who is not doing God's will by the standard of his holy law was about to be cut down and thrown into the lake of fire or into the eternal fire. Now, again, John was not doing this to influence people, you know, to become everyone's friend, but he actually was being a friend to them because what he was doing was telling them the truth. And he was telling them these things in order to shake them up, in order to wake them up, and it appears as though it did work on some of them. In verse 10, the crowds were questioning him, saying, then what shall we do? You know, that reminds me of when uh, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost and he was indicting the Jews for crucifying their Messiah. And when he finally convinced them again by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that is absolutely necessary here as well, they said, brethren, what shall we do? Okay, that's the response, of course, we're looking for. What, what should they do? Well, repent, okay? You need to repent. So John gives them a few examples. The man with two tunics who only needs one and has a neighbor that has none, share your tunic with him, okay? If you have food and a neighbor that doesn't have food, do the same with that. The tax collectors, he also notes, uh, they were those who were using their position to make themselves rich. John told them not to collect any more than they had been ordered. And then to the soldiers, and here, this is interesting, isn't it? Because there were some Ro Roman soldiers who were also interested in what John had to say. You know, everybody wants to go see what, what the hubbub's about, right? And they hear about this great prophet. So they're going out there, they're listening to John, and they say, well, what should we do? And he told them, not to take money by force. By the way, why did he tell them that? It's because that's what they were doing. Or to accuse anyone falsely and to be content with their wages. So like the tax collector, they would stop extorting their neighbor for their own good. So by God's grace, 
his ministry had an awakening effect on some of them, okay? Now they were better prepared to receive Christ. So now what we want to do is we want to try to think about how we would apply this to the situations that maybe we have to face, okay? What can we do to help those who say they believe in the gospel but who don't want to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the only thing we can really do to help them is to provide motivation, right? Provide motivation. That's what John did for Israel. He motivated them using the Word of God, okay? Now, we first need to remind them of their condition. And by the way, as I said, we're not supposed to stand up on a soapbox and point our fingers down at them and, you know, scald them with, um, the, with the truth. But rather, we are to bring it to them in a, in a loving way, right? In a way that shows that we really are concerned about them. But to tell them what the Bible says about them. And think about Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul is talking the, to the Ephesians and reminding them of what they once were apart from Christ, how they uh, walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of disobedience. Uh, among them all, too, we walked in the lusts of our flesh, and we were the children of wrath, even as the rest. Well, that's what John the Baptist told the, the Jews. They were the children of the devil. They were the children of wrath. And how do we demonstrate that to these people if they're not already convinced of that? Well, you can do that quite easily. Uh, you've perhaps uh, seen a method of evangelism where you take somebody through the, the Ten Commandments and have you done this, have you done that, have you not done this, have you not done that? Um, and that's, that's helpful. But there are two commandments that summarize all the ten that really show us quite clearly that all of us have broken those commandments. Do you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Do you love your neighbor as you love yourself? So we can bring, bring the, the law of God to bear on them, try to wake them up, try to show them their condition. Secondly, we need to remind them again of their future. What can you expect if you continue in the way that you're going right now? Well, all you can expect, of course, is God's wrath. And by the way, we are talking about people who believe the Bible is the Word of God, so we can, if we can prove that from the Bible, that's really all we need to do. If they begin to argue against the Bible, you know, I don't believe that part of the Bible, we can give them the evidence that they need to accept all the Bible because all of it is the Word of God. Now, next, I think we need to point out that um, judgment is near. Right? That's what John did for the Jews. And when you think about it, 70 AD was still, what, 43 years off. But we need to remember as well what uh, we're reminded by a couple of authors in Scripture, and that is that life is very brief. Life is just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And theirs may vanish uh, sooner than they think. Now, I hate to use this as an example, but think of the, the young man who was... Um, riding his motorcycle in the Dunn family. He, he didn't know he was... We don't know exactly what happened on that motorcycle. Maybe he was hit by a car. That's usually what happens when you're riding a motorcycle. Um, but you, you don't know when things like that are going to happen. Uh, I had a friend with a very optimistic view and used to say, you know, I could, I could just step off this curb and twist my ankle the wrong way, fall and break my neck, and I'm dead. <laughs> he was kind of a unique um, individual, okay? But that could happen, you know? We, we don't know. There are... I remember when I was, um, oh, I was still riding a bicycle. I think I was then around four, 15 years of age, a little bit um, younger than that. I remember seeing two, two Cessnas collide in midair. And um, we, we rode our bikes over to where they landed. And they, uh, when the firemen got there and the emergency workers and they pulled the fence out of the way, there were these bodies that were just mangled up in, in the uh, fuselage of these planes. And I'm sure that the people who were flying those planes were not expecting to die on that particular day. Or what happened when the Cessna ran into the uh, airliner in uh, San Diego years ago? Um, they weren't expecting that either. So life can be over before you think it's going to be. And the Bible says it's appointed to man once to die, and then 
the judgment. So we can point out to them that judgment is near. It may be nearer than they think. And of course, we can point them to Christ. Like evangelists in Pilgrim's Progress, point them in the right direction. Encourage them to run straight to Him because He is the only one who can reconcile them to God. But now having said that, we need to realize that even that isn't enough, okay? Even that isn't enough. Um, the most that we can do in doing these things is perhaps alarm them temporarily, you know, and maybe we can get them going uh, in the right direction, but it's going to break off pretty quickly unless something else happens, unless the Lord works through the things we say, okay? The Spirit needs to convict them. The Spirit needs to awaken them. He may do this as we speak to them, but if not, then we need to pray that He would wake them up, okay? Now, I should also mention this, that even if, the, even if He does wake them up, even if the Spirit of God does this, as Jonathan Edwards would tell his people, and they begin to seek the Lord, okay, they still may not find the Lord. Now, awakening is not the same thing as a new birth. We have to remember there is such a thing as awakening, okay? It is a ministry of the Holy Spirit working on the conscience. The conscience is that faculty God has given to each of us that tells us when we do it's right or when we do it's wrong, makes us feel good or makes us feel bad, makes us feel guilty. And when the Spirit of God wakes somebody up, what He's doing is He's bringing them out of their complacency, out of the, that safety they thought they were in, and making them concerned, concerned enough to seek the Lord. Now, the new birth is something altogether different. The new birth is the Spirit's work of changing the heart, changing their nature so that they, from within, go after the Lord. You know, they begin to pursue Him. They trust in Christ as soon as uh, they are regenerated. So awakening makes them concerned enough to begin seeking the Lord. Regeneration is a change of nature. Now, we know that no one who is awakened and seeking the Lord is ever going to find the Lord uh, without the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, without the new birth. And the reason is because they will never want to find Him without the new birth. So awakening of conscience makes you afraid of judgment and it drives you forward towards Christ, but it still doesn't make you love Him. It still won't make you want to trust Him. Only the Spirit's work of regeneration will do that. So another thing the Puritans, as we're talking about, you know, seeking evangelism, another thing that the Puritans always reminded their hearers was, no matter how long you seek, you are not obligating the Lord to save you because all you're doing really is sinning. <laughs> you don't love Him. You're seeking Him just for a ticket out of hell. You're still sinning against Him. So he says, if you seek for 20 years, 20 years of sinning is not going to bend the Lord's arm. It still is totally dependent on Him and His grace. So again, to summarize this point, we, if they're not going to seek the Lord, we need to continue to seek the Lord for them by bringing them the Word, bringing them the law, bringing them the, the warnings of judgment, reminding them of the brevity of life, and by praying for them that the Spirit of God might wake them up. So we need to, to do this until they begin to seek. And then we need to keep praying for them while they're seeking and encouraging them until they finally find or until we can't seek any longer because our lives have come to an end. We need to seek the Lord for those who are not going to seek it for themselves. We can't expect them to do it because they're not motivated. We need to provide that motivation and pray that God would give them that ultimate motivation. And then finally, we need to ask this question, how should we approach those with a false hope? You know, who think they're on their way to heaven, like these Jews who trusted in their physical relationship to Abraham. Well, first of all, we need to realize, I think, that um, all false hope is based, I think, on one thing, and that is works, okay? They think that they're good enough already. The, the Jews were trusting in their relationship with Abraham. Our 
being related to him is enough because God is going to save Abraham's children. Well, they were mistaken. That particular work of procreation was, was not enough, okay? But most people today actually believe that they are good enough. Remember what R.C. Sproul had to say? Most people believe in justification by death. All you have to do is die and, and you go to heaven. But most people think, again, my good works are going to outweigh my bad works and that God's going to receive me and only the real bad people go to hell. So they're trusting in their works, okay? We need to be ready to drive them out of that. It's either the good works they do or it's their membership in a religious organization. You know, that, that that's going to do it, okay? But which is also works. So what, does a, what do Roman Catholics typically trust in for their salvation? The fact that they're a part of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the fact that maybe they go to Mass once a year <laughs> or that they were baptized, okay? And even though they may have destroyed their justification from their baptism because they committed a mortal sin, there's still the second plank of justification, which is doing penance. And so they're trusting in baptism and penance in order to get into heaven. And then there are those in, in liberal Lutheran churches who have turned the gospel into uh, really a gospel of water. Um, we sanctify this water, we baptize the, the, the infant, and the infant is born again, you know, born again through this baptism. Now, Luther believed that that happened, sadly, but um, he believed that God gave the infant faith, and that's why the child was saved, by the faith the child had. But liberal Lutherans today don't even look at the faith anymore. They just think the water of baptism saves these children. And even if they grow up and become, well, let's say express the wickedness that's in their hearts, they still believe they're saved because they were baptized. Jehovah's Witnesses trust in their membership in the Watchtower Society, and they trust in their good works of going door to door trying to proselytize. Mormons essentially do the same thing. So the question is, what do you do for a person who is complacent, a person who thinks they're safe, a person who's trusting in their work, so their, their connection to some kind of an organization? Well, again, we need to do what John did for these Jews. We need to pull out that false hope from under them, okay? We need to give them compelling reasons, first of all, to, to accept God's Word as the standard. That's usually where most of the work is done. And then we need to prove that from the Word of God that the things that they hope in cannot save them. You know, when, when Donna and I were, were ministering to her mother, you know, she, she was a part of a liberal Lutheran church and she was trusting in her baptism. So we kept showing her from Scripture that baptism is not what saves you. Baptism is not what the Apostle Paul did. He went out and preached the gospel. He didn't send me. He says, Christ didn't send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. But if baptism saves you, what sense does that make in light of Luther's or the Lutheran view that baptism, in fact, does save you? We need to prove that what they're trusting in does not save them from the Word of God, that those who are of the works of the law are under the curse, and then point them to the only one who can save them. Again, remembering that we need to pray, don't we? We need to pray that the Spirit of God will take His Word and bring it home. Because really, without His work of convicting, without His work of awakening, they're never going to seek. And without converting His work of the new birth, they never really, really will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to drive them out of their security. We need to drive them to Christ. So nothing, nothing unusual, nothing that perhaps we didn't already know, but perhaps something to, to remind us that we do have to say things that aren't going to be popular you know, with people. But I think if we show genuine love and concern for their soul, that they will likely listen to us. And only by God's grace will they receive it. And we do need to pray for them. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us in, in this regard.